So here's the slide that I'm borrowing from the class that will become the Architecture 4001 class. And it talks about a basic methodology for port IO access that some devices uses, including the one we're going to look at in a second. And this methodology is called using a index data pair. And so the idea is that the IO device that you're trying to access is nominally organized into some sort of like memory array type thing. And, you know, maybe some things are control registers and some things are data. But there's a notion of first you have to write to a index port to say what particular index in this notional array you want to access. And then you read or write from a data port. And that's going to basically specify, like, are you trying to read from that index or write to that index? So here in this diagram, for instance, the port that we might write to for the index is port four, uh, sorry, the, is port 70. So the index is port 70 because that's moved into DX. And then a particular immediate value we would write there is four. So zero, one, two, three, four. So we're saying the index that I want to read or write from is index four. So I'm going to take four and I'm going to output it to DX, which was set to 70, which is the index port for this particular chunk of hardware. Then if I want to read in from that, I would take 71, which is the data port, and I would write that into DX. And then I would run the in instruction and I would read in a single byte. So this is the AL, so it's gonna be a single byte from DX, which is port 71, the data port. And because I already set up the index in the previous step, it knows that it's trying to read in a single byte from index four of this black box device. So there's various devices that use this sort of thing. CMOS, which we'll see next. PCIe, which you'll see more in the Architecture 4000 class. Or for instance, here's a very good publication that I like that was examining the Dell E6400 embedded controller. They did a whole bunch of reversing and you know they showed in that how it used port IO in order to access it. But the device we want to look at now is called the real-time clock or CMOS. And this is a thing going way back to some of the original PCs. And what it has is 14 bytes of date info. Like, so this is the clock side of things, real-time clock. So date info, and then it has a few configuration registers that we're not gonna care about. And after that, there is 114 bytes of just arbitrary, an operating system, a BIOS, anybody can do anything with it as long as they have port IO capabilities. So 114 bytes that was later expanded with another extra 128 bytes. So why is this called CMOS? It's because the memory that you're actually accessing when you do this port IO, when you go past these date time information and go into the bytes, the memory itself is physically called static RAM or SRAM. And SRAM is made up of CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So it's a type of transistor. And so these transistors can be used for storing information. It's actually the same thing that's used for registers uh, in the CPU, but just like registers, when the power goes away from it. So specifically CMOS is typically backed by a physical battery, an extra battery inside of a uh, motherboard. And so that essentially ensures that this will retain its contents and it sort of acts as a non-volatile RAM it's non-volatile up until the point where this battery dies, essentially. That's also why, you know, certain BIOS makers in the past, when they had BIOS passwords and things like that, you could clear the BIOS password by just removing the coin cell because it meant that their BIOS password implementation was using the CMOS memory behind the scenes. And so when some lock bit or something went away from the CMOS, then it lost that particular setting. So what the first indices of CMOS look like if you were to access them, if you were to access index zero, you would be getting the seconds time according to the real time clock. Index two is the minutes, index four is the hours, and then year, month, day of the month, day of the week. So basically this is the clock information and when you initially set up your clock in your operating system or your BIOS, it will configure this and then ever after, uh, because that power is being provided to the hardware, it will just keep ticking forward even when, you know, the system is nominally shut down. This hardware is still powered and it's still going to just keep track of what time it is until you remove one of those batteries, for instance. And then after that, once you get to indices E through 7F, that's where you just have this arbitrary SRAM, which any operating system or BIOS, anyone with port IO can go ahead and put, put anything into. 
So just here's a quick screenshot from, you know, one of the, the data sheets, which, you know, was nice because it was all on one page, basically saying, you know, there's two banks of 128 bytes each, the standard and extended bank. And then it says right here that the ports for the port IO, it's port 70 for the index register and port 71 for the data or target register. And that's for the first bank, that's the, the clock information and the first bits of CMOS. And then for it's port 72 for the extended RAM index register and 73 for the extended RAM target or data port.